Okay, so now let's take a look at effects at some time to leave system. Now it isn't as simple as configuring a stale time and then after it has expired, it is going to clean up the atom. It actually uses a more sophisticated timing. And why? Well, to balance performance and of course, memory usage. So the first key component that you need to understand is that it has a bucketing structure strategy. And what this means is a trivial approach would assign individual timers for each atom. So if you configure an atom to have a stale time of five seconds, a trivial implementation would create a set timeout for that atom. But that would be expensive. For reference, one of my production applications has over 500 active atoms in just one subtree. So in Instead, effect atom groups atoms into time buckets. So the default bucket size is one second. Atoms that expire around the same time get grouped together. And consequently, we only have one cleanup operation per time bucket. So let me quickly draw up a diagram. So let's say we have three time buckets. So we have A, B, and we have C. And let's say you're using the default timeout resolution, which is of one second. So what this is going to do is first round up each atom's time to leave up to the next whole bucket size. So in other words, it is going to quantize the time to leave, which makes it the atom's guaranteed minimum life. Then it is going to calculate the expiration time. So it adds this rounded or quantized time to leave to the current time. And this this is what determines the moment the atom's guarantee runs out. And finally, it is going to assign a bucket. So it will place it in the next available time slot after its expiration. So whichever bucket that runs immediately after its expiration time. So let's take atom B as an example. Let's say that the current time is 10,000 milliseconds or 10 seconds. And the bucket interval again is one second and the time to leave requested. So time to leave requested is 2.1 seconds. So here, the very first step is to round up the atoms time to leave. So we know it is 2.1 seconds. We know the bucket interval is one second. So we round up to the next highest multiple of the bucket interval, which is three seconds. So rounded is equal to three seconds. Then we calculate the expiration time. So we add these quantized time to leave to the current time. So 10 seconds plus three seconds, we get 13 seconds seconds. And finally, we place the atom to the next time bucket. So 13 seconds plus one second is 14 seconds. So in short, as we can see, atom V gets placed in the B time bucket, which again is of 14 seconds. So as we can see, it is very memory efficient, but there's a catch. If you're not careful, it can bite you, you know where and why? Well, let's imagine the current time is five seconds. And let's say you have an atom time to leave of one second. However, your bucket interval, which is the timeout resolution is 10 seconds. So if you quantize these, you get 10 seconds. So one times 10, then you calculate the expiration. Say we are five seconds in. So we say five seconds plus 10 seconds, you get back 15 seconds from the start. And then you assign the bucket, which in this case would be 20 seconds. So when will your atom expire? Well, subtract five from 20. So it is not going to dispose the atom unless 15 seconds have passed. So ultimately it depends on your needs. This is up to you. You can configure the timeout resolution to whatever you want, but I would say the default timeout resolution is a good starting point. Now, moving on from the bucketing strategy, there's an another point to consider. And that is, there are global versus per atom timeouts. 
where the global time to leave will act as the default time to leave for all atoms. Then you can override the time to leave per atom, which we're going to see in a moment. And finally, you can mark atoms as keep alive, which will ignore all time to leave settings, which means that they will never be destroyed. And now, at last, let's understand the life cycle flow. So the very first thing that needs to happen is for the atom to become idle. And that means there are no subscribers. Once that happens, the time to leave countdown starts, it then groups the atom into the time bucket, and if it gets accessed before expiration, then the timer will reset. However, if the bucket expires, the atom will get removed. Now, there are some important rules you need to consider. First, dependencies will prevent cleanup, meaning if you have two atoms, one is a parent, the other one is the child, and the child is accessed, then logically the parent atom will not be idle. Second, keep alive atoms ignore all time to leave settings. Pretty obvious, but you never know. And the third, removed atoms get completely recreated on next access. And this last one is very, very important. Why? Because it can lead to infinite loops. So to expand on this last point, I have this playground where we have this parent atom. So no dependencies, it is completely independent, where we log parent atom, we sleep for half a second, and then we log parent atom completed. And then we have this child atom. Same thing, we do the logs, we sleep for one second, and then we do a yield get dot result, and we pass in parent atom. Now this is going to establish a relationship in such way that child atom now becomes a dependent of parent atom. So if parent atom were to change, then logically child atom will be re-executed. But notice how it's all a synchronous work with the default idle time to leave, which if I'm not mistaken is zero. Or well, actually I think it's undefined, but functionally equivalent to zero. Anyway, after this, here in our main program, we just do an atom.get result. So we are mounting and executing child atom. And we lock the final result. And here, notice how I'm providing registry.layer, which by default doesn't really come with anything pre configured aside from, I guess, the timeout resolution. But as we can see, if we inspect the logs, we are getting infinite logs. It seems to be executing forever and it's getting truncated. So let's rerun this. And as we can see, now we have child atom, then after sleep, then the parent atom, then it completes. So we get to this point. However, we never reach this point. Everything gets reset again. So child atom, after sleep, and so on and so forth. And why is that happening? Well, let's trace it back and let's create a sequence here. So child atom starts, we get the log for child atom. Then child atom sleeps. So we get the child atom after sleep. And third, we have the crucial part, which is get dot result parent atom. And this creates a dependency where a child atom waits for parent atom. Now, why is this important? Well, that's because for the fourth step, the parent atom completion invalidates child atom which makes child atom to get restarted. And now by restarting, child atom invalidation removes itself from parent atom's children list. So basically a uh, remove child is called. And that means that parent atom now has no children and becomes eligible for disposal. So can be removed is equal to true. And thus parent atom gets immediately 
this post, particularly because default idle time to leave is undefined. So immediate disposal, then child at some restarts and calls get result again. But parent atom node was destroyed. So new parent atom nodes get created and we get a fresh execution again and cycle repeats infinitely. So this is pretty much it. So what can you do against this? Well, we have already identified the root cause and that's because with no idle time to leave, then there's an immediate disposal. So we can come here and say idle time to leave to 20 seconds. And by doing this, if we save and wait for this to execute again, we get child atom after sleep, then parent atom completed. This triggers a change again. So child atom gets re-executed and so we get these two logs again but finally we get parent child completed why because this is now cached another way to go around this is to say keep alive which is what we just talked about so it will be there forever and that's it now, the cool thing about this is that you can leverage scopes. So the scope lifetime in this case will be tied to the lifetime of the atom, which means that you can, for example, add a finalizer here saying console and this comes from effect and it's not importing console.log and then parent atom finalizer. And if we save this, wait for this to execute again, we know that it is going to get destroyed and hence we get parent atom finalizer. So this is really, really powerful as for example, you may want to temporarily read something from index DB, but once you're done with it, you want to delete the binary locally or whatever, then effect atom gives you this power for free with all of the effect guarantees, of course. Anyway, this is it. I hope you learned something new. If you have any questions or feedback, do let me know. And if you want to see more content like this, make sure to subscribe. I'll see you in the next one. See ya.